So, um, lots going on in the world of HR. And it's literally the world of HR. We have about eight billion people on the planet. Four and a half billion of those people will go to work somewhere in some way on the planet every day. So in many ways, work is at the center of everything. For those of you who don't know, I'm a lawyer by training. And oftentimes, we think of the important professions as lawyers and doctors and things like that. But let me tell you, HR is increasingly, and this is not just because I'm saying it, but everyone is saying is the it profession, if that makes sense. We're becoming the it profession. Because ultimately, people need to work. And even the people who don't need to work for financial reasons, young lady, they do it because of the dignity in work. We have to remember that. There are incredibly wealthy people who nonetheless go to work every day because there's dignity in work. And what we do is facilitate that work. We ensure that people have the opportunity to do so, do so in the right environments, that they're paid fairly and equitably, and that they're treated decently at work. Notice, I say decently, because we don't control a lot of the people manager's actions. We do our best, right, to influence it, but that's what we are about. We are about work, and therefore, every person is going to be ultimately touched, influenced, impacted by an HR professional. And that's why this work is so important. But something has happened recently, something that's really put the whole world, turned it all on a dime, and it's this concept of AI, artificial intelligence. I'm gonna spend more time talking with you, and I only have 30 minutes, so I'm gonna get in and out of this. I could do a whole deep conversation on it, but what we know is it has literally transformed everything. So I was sitting in San Diego at a big conference, San Diego, California. I have to remember I'm not in America, so San Diego, California. I'm at a conference, and we had just introduced AI. This was April of 2023. Now, AI, for all of you should know, has been around for a long time. They've been working on it, but it was just introduced to the mass public. So we're at this conference, and everyone is lamenting complaining about, concerned about, afraid of AI. And what was AI going to do to human beings and to society as we know it? And I don't know, I'm not a mathematician, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer by training, so I said to the group, pause for a second. This is not about AI replacing human beings. I don't think that's possible for a whole bunch of reasons that we're gonna talk about, but it will complement human beings. And so off the top of my head, I said AI, artificial intelligence, plus HI, human intelligence, will create the new ROI. And all of a sudden, the room erupted. These were really smart people, so I felt smart for one moment in my life. And they said, yes, you got it. That's the new equation, my friends. It is AI plus HI. We know that this is going to be the new ROI. We've been talking about this since 2023, and it's increasingly, every day, becoming true and truer. But I want to talk to you why this is, talk to you a little bit about why this has really stressed everyone. It's because ultimately, there are two things that present an existential threat to human beings. It's a threat to their lives and a threat to their livelihoods. Only two things. And what we know is two dates will forever be etched in the minds of for our minds in history. March 13th of 2020. I often refer to that as Friday the 13th because it happened to be a Friday the 13th and not the movie. It was the day that the globe decided that this whole thing called COVID was a real problem. We talked about it, we thought that maybe just in Asia, maybe just in Africa, maybe in other parts of the world, but March 13th, 2020, globally, the world was on notice that there was a problem. That, my friends, was a date that we understood that our lives were at risk. And remember, people dying all around us. We heard of people being furloughs. We saw everything happening around that date. Well, the latest date is November 29th of 2022. Who in here remembers what that date is? What date was that? The man said it right. He gets the big bang, the big prize. Open AI released chat GPT. November 29th of 2022. And from that moment, 
Fear struck a lot of people because it was the fear of affecting and impacting your livelihoods. So keep that in mind. As we talk about this, your employees are concerned about two things, their lives and their livelihoods. And with that context, we can begin to understand why and how we as HR professionals, HR professionals in Africa, need to do something to bring our people along. I want to put this in context here. Very different topic, but related, and I'll show you how later. This concept that we talk about now about VUCA, this is a phrase that business executives around the globe, CEOs are talking about a lot, HR practitioners. And it's an era, an era that we know, which means we're going to be very volatile for a while, very uncertain. The idea that you are going to be able to tell your employees what the future looks like, you're wrong, you won't. Complex, yes, it is both complex and complicated, and ambiguity for all of you who think you need to know. When your employees say, I just want certainty, I want to know what we're doing next. Remember back in the day, you used to have a business plan, we would do five-year business plans, strategic plans, no one's doing those anymore. You're lucky if you're doing a three-year business plan. Increasingly, businesses have to be agile. The plan will change from month to month and for sure from year to year. Well, that means we now have this world that we live in called VUCA. Tell you about VUCA, and I wanted to show this as just an example about how much change we're now experiencing as a people. From 1986 to 1996, and I used spot prices on oil as a way to illustrate the point. Standard deviation, barely any adjustments for a decade. But then you go to the next decade, from 1997 to 2007, 12.6. So it's nearly quadrupling. Fast forward, a doubling of change is occurring from this period 2006-07 until where we are now. There's significant change. That's the point of the slide. And I want to, again, you may say, well, what does it have to do with us? It has everything to do with you because there's consistent change, and we can't predict it. In fact, we need this thing called AI. The human brain can't do it, process it, make, tr make truth of it fast enough. We actually need AI. And we've got to remember that when we're talking to our employees about this. This is the thing that will actually save you, not hurt you. And the more we can make that the narrative, remove the fear from this conversation, we're going to be able to get our people to accept and adjust where this is all going. OK, you have something, and I talk about this a lot around the world. The Americans, in particular, didn't have children in meaningful numbers. Funny story, starting about the year 2000, the American birth rate went on a serious decline. During COVID, COVID, the year 2020, the American birth rate dropped 4%. Now I want you to understand, we're already a relatively small company, a country, 335 million or so people. I, you, bless you. Our birth rate actually dropped an additional 4% in the year 2020. And so here we are in a situation where the economy is growing, we have more of a need for people, but we have fewer people. And here's a funny one. In the U.S., the, the millennials and Generation Z are now in what they call a sex recession. Yeah, true story. Yeah, they're not having sex, so guess what? If you're not having sex, you're not having babies. So we have a real problem. We have a birth rate problem in the U.S. Our unemployment, we had 11 million open jobs as recently as two years ago. It's now down to get ready, 8 million open jobs in America. That means 8 million jobs that can't be filled, that companies can't use to exploit the financial resources that they have. So we have a birth rate problem. You, on the other hand, don't. But it's not just America. <laughs> you don't have a whole bunch of friends, right? But now you could see that as a negative. Obviously, you all are not in a sex recession. But anyway, I go ahead. Um, the reality is we know that the world is going to need human beings. Even with the adoption of AI, even with this fear of AI, we're going to need human beings. Funny story, I think my friend Fumi is here from Japan. She may be here somewhere in the room. But amazingly, Japan, true story, currently sells more adult diapers than baby diapers. That just tells you the developed world is aging. So Africa has something that a lot of the world does not. You, India, and it's this. 
Hear the numbers, buy the numbers. I gotta get this thing to work. All right, fertility rate, 4.1. That is insane. I mean, you all are absolutely fertile, and that's a wonder. <laughs> That's a good thing, because the world needs human beings, notwithstanding all of this AI adoption. The second thing, if I can get my slide to work, is your unemployment rate. Now, in the U.S. right now, unemployment rate is 4.2%, 4.1, 4.2%. You have a significantly higher unemployment rate. Now, that may be a negative from your perception. I can tell you, for those of us who've lived through three, two percent unemployment rates, it's no fun, because then you can't find the talent. But these are all differentiators, because you not only have people, but you have people who are willing, able, and looking for work. That is something the rest of the world doesn't necessarily enjoy. Another stat about Africa, which is, they told me this would happen, is your labor participation rate. It rivals that of the United States of America. We're at about the same number. You're actually a little bit higher. That is the percentage of people who are actually up in the workforce. That's an amazing stat. But you have that going for you. And then this is the thing. Your sub-Saharan age, it's amazing, 70% of your population is under 30. Remember, these are people who, from an HR perspective, these are your future workers. The rest of us across the globe don't have future workers. We're concerned about it. Here's a crazy stat in the United States. The fastest growing segment, I want you to hear this HR practitioners, the fastest growing segment of the US workforce are people 75 and older. 75 and older, and that's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's good. Now, it's a small number, but it is growing at a clip that we've never seen. They are not retiring. We need them in the workforce. And then your population growth by 2050. You're going to be through the roof. You're going to have people everywhere, and the world is watching this very closely. It's why I'm here. Well, I'm here because I want to be here, but I'm here because this is going to be, you talk about the birthplace of the world, this is going to be the economy of the world. And for those of you who don't believe it, you have to. If you look at what has happened, right, you have to see it. India was in a very similar position, and then all of a sudden they took off. And they used the fact that they have bodies, they have human beings, and the rest of it. So this is not a negative for you. It is net-net a positive, and I hope we embrace that because it's a huge key differentiator for you. Okay, so let's talk about here are the problems, though. Because obviously, with every opportunity, there are problems. And let me talk to you about it. Go back to my slide, because we got a lot going on. This thing is just catching up. Okay. Penetration for AI is very low in this country. Just 25 to 30 percent of the population is adopting and using AI. Globally, according to McKinsey, that number is 50 percent. So you are trailing. You have people, but you're not adopting and embracing AI. That's a challenge and an opportunity for all AI profession HR professionals. And then secondly, people are afraid of it. It's true in Africa, it's a true in America because of the threat that it presents to their jobs. And the media has not helped this any. And this is what I was showing up to you just a few seconds ago, is all of the headlines. These are the headlines of the day. It is scaring your employees mindless. They're looking at the risk. What will this do? Remember we said lives and livelihoods. This is what they're seeing. AI is coming for your job. Here's how AI will come from your job. These are pulled right out of the media of the day, is that people are really, really nervous about what does this thing do? It means we won't have jobs. And I'm sorry, guys, that I'm doing, I'm toggling hands and everything to make this computer work. But, and now, this one here is the most important. Automation, as we knew it, historically did what? It affected blue-collar jobs. AI is going to impact white-collar jobs. We're seeing it in the US right now. We're seeing Wall Street, our financial markets. They hire fewer and fewer analysts. So you go spend all of this time in college, four years, then you go get an MBA from a really expensive college or university, and you come out and you can't find a job because we're hiring fewer of those people. AI is not just a threat. It's not simple automation. It's a lot deeper than that. It's actually beginning to affect white-collar jobs, and we believe that it will infect them more and more. So if Against, and against this backdrop, you have to realize that your employees are concerned. This is what they're saying now, Dow. It will do the work. And do you remember back in the day we were telling everyone to go to coding academies? It's amazing. We were racing everyone to do coding, and now 
You don't need as many coders because of AI. So it is shifting. That VUCA, that term that I refused earlier, as fast as you think you've figured it out or you've prepared your plans, the game changes. And that's what we in HR are confronting right now is a changing game. We can't keep up with it, and that's all in account. We've not seen anything yet when we talk about what and how this AI story will turn about. One other thing I'd like each of you all to understand, there is a distinction. We use AI generically. And we talk about generative AI, and then we talk about AI. But I just want to set up something for everyone in the room to, if you take away nothing else, is to understand the thoughts around this. AI as we know it, artificial intelligence. We know this. We know this. And everyone should accept it. 50% of jobs, there's a solution to this, but I want you to know this. We believe that the jobs will either go away or, or be so significantly reconstituted by 2027 that 50% of the jobs globally are going to be displaced. That's a term you're going to hear a lot in HR is displacement. But here's what gets kind of scary, and no one's talking about this. There is a difference. There's something called AGI, which is Artificial General Intelligence. And that's the notion, the notion that this thing can do almost everything that a human being can do. And we're seeing some interesting statistics. This quote caught my attention. I'm going to make sure I don't fall off the stage. But <laughs> this, this quote caught my attention. 50% of jobs versus this suggestion that nearly 100% of what we do can go away. Now, Elon Musk says, no, it's probably just 20%. But even a 20% chance that significantly everything that a human being can do will be impacted by AGI. That's when the computer is doing everything. Right now you feel comfortable. You're like, no, no, it could never happen. AI can't do this. You're right, AI is our friend. It's the complement to what we do. AGI could be a real problem because it says that computer, anyone saw that crazy, it was horrible. I have a 14 year old daughter, she made me go watch this movie. Um, what was the name of this one? It's a little girl, Megan. It's a disaster movie. But anyway, um, the idea is it could get pretty ugly up here. And what we're trying to do around the globe is control what AI can be allowed to do. We know what it can do. And HR, we're going to be involved in the discussions around how do you do it. But here's some good news. Anyone watch the movie Hidden Figures? If you haven't, it's an amazing movie. I'd like to say, so the backdrop is this. In the United States, everyone knows our history of slavery, the trade transatlantic sla trade slavery. We also know the story of what we did with women and the suffrage rights. Women did not have the rights in our country until recently. So this is a pretty big deal. So the movie was set in the South. We had four African-American women. These women were called computers. They were college-educated women who were mathematicians, statisticians, really brilliant women, and they worked for NASA. NASA is the agency, our space agency. So they were hired to literally do the computations, as you see here, to put Americans on the moon. And so that's the point. They were hidden figures because no one knew what they were doing, but they were the critical component necessary to put America on the moon, hidden figures. But guess what? Well into their process, we're all ready to go into the moon, getting ready to go to the moon, and IBM introduces a computer. Remember, they were called computers because they actually computed. And then in the new world, the new world, there was now a machine that would take their jobs. That was the difference, and we are at that moment again. That was our hidden figures moment. But instead of those women walking away, giving up, saying, I'm out of here, too bad I've wasted my life with this degree, they learned, I can't compute as fast as that computer can do it, as expertly as the computer can do it, but I can learn to fix the computer. I can learn to program the computer. I can learn to design computers. They literally retrained, reskilled themselves to be competitive in the next iteration of our societal advancements due to technology. We, my friends, are right now at a hidden figures moment. AI does present, and anyone and any of you who don't tell your employees you're going to be impacted, you're not doing your job because AI is coming. AI is going to impact HR. In fact, the earliest, earliest savings and opportunities we saw was in HR as a practice. So let's talk about what we in Africa must do. 
if we're going to address this issue. I'm wrapping this up now because I want to open this to some Q&A. The first thing that you must do, and I've alluded to it, is each of you should go through your organizations and determine which jobs and which people are going to be impacted. You owe it to your people, whether it's two years, three years, five years, putting your heads in the sand and saying this is not going to happen is a bad idea. I was just with the CHRO of Microsoft just recently, and she said they went through a full exercise. Now, of course, they know what AI can do because they, they are a big player in the AI space. They literally went through their entire workforce and said, let's be clear, these people can and will likely be impacted over the next two or three years. Big deal for them. And then what do you do? So you have identified them. You got to be honest with people. We don't like to do this a lot, but you need to tell people. It is very clear that what you do right now as an accountant, it takes 20 accountants to run this finance function. If we adopt AI and really embrace it, go from that 25% to that 50% or that 75%, some of these jobs are going to be impacted. We will just need fewer of you. Be honest with people. But the third step is the most important. Do what we did in Hidden Figures. Take the folks upskill and reskill the talent so that they have jobs on the other side of it. So if you're an accountant right now, and this is the HR responsibility, we're not, most of us, I know I'm not, I'm no technologist, but what I know is that there will be jobs that are going to be impacted, jobs and people, impacted hands down. We have to be honest with people about it and then help those employees see a pathway forward. And if you wait too long, they won't be prepared. Here's a challenge that we have right now in the US. So you're, we have coders, we have people who are doing coding. We have people who are truck drivers, for example. I want to bring this down to a job that all of you can understand. You're a truck driver. If, in fact, AI advances to the point where we have autonomous vehicles, we will no longer need those truck drivers. It is someone's responsibility in HR within a trucking and a logistics company right now to start looking at the drivers and saying, when we replace you, because AI will allow us to do it, here's what we will have prepared you to do on the other side of that. Do we understand that HR professionals, that's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to our employees, it's our responsibility to our society, is to ensure that people can enjoy the dignity of work. I started with the notion of explaining to you that people existentially are threatened by a threat to their lives and their livelihoods. What we know is that AI is absolutely a threat. It's real. Huge opportunity, by the way, and if you haven't seen the advances in healthcare, education, how we can, we can do this, but it's happening, and the answer can't be to deny that it's not happening. As we close, I just want to show you real quickly some ideas of what we're seeing in industry right now, just from a practical HR standpoint. These are four scenarios you can pick. There's eight or ten of them, personas. First of all, you have Emilio. The guy is 65 years old. He's a copywriter. That means he's in a journalism profession. And let me tell you how that's going away and how that's being impacted. He's afraid of losing his job to AI. What does a strong HR function do for Emilio? They begin to immediately train him to use AI effectively. I'm often asked the question, Johnny, in HR, will AI take my job? The answer is no, but someone who's proficient with AI will take your job. That's the difference. AI in and of itself, we're not talking AGI, I'm talking AI. If AI won't take your job, but the person who shows up to the interview meets with your hiring manager and says, I know how to make us more productive in our recruitment process by embracing and using technologies, that person is the threat to you. It's not AI in and of itself. We said the same thing to Emilio. We're like, listen, you've got to get to the point where you can use this to become better. And from an HR standpoint, it's going to help you on recruitment and onboarding. Dr. Nasira, she's a doctor, medical physician. You'd like to think, OK, AI doesn't touch her. Well, the reality is she knows that transcribing clinical notes is time consuming. There is a way for us to uh, use this opportunity to help her free her up to spend time with her patients, which is what she really wants to do. We as HR should be finding all sorts of ways for our employees to be freed up from the work they don't actually want to do. It's not value add, it's tedious, it's painful. We can help them if we literally analyze the jobs and figure out how we can embrace moving again that goal from 25% to 30%. 
Kevin, I forgot to say, Kevin, a very interesting guy here. Kevin has dyslexia and it makes his writing very difficult. He is a consultant. All of us have employees who are touched in different ways with different types of disabilities. And so, so we say to Kevin, what can we do as HR? We are his HR group, our professionals, what we can do. We can find out how to use chat GPT, chat, I can never say that word, now, chat GPT to, to dictate. He can create articles based upon that. We can increase his productivity and minimize his errors. So we're taking what is a negative, Kevin, the dyslexic, HR has found a way to teach him how to use AI to make him more and more effective at his job. And last but certainly not least, you have the accountants. I've talked about the accountants a lot because if you are in an organization as accountants, you should know you will be significantly impacted by AI significantly, let no one tell you this. So right now, but this one is not about accounting, because I've already talked about it. It's about her being pregnant. She came in to interview during the process. Let me tell you something, as much as we believe that you know the machine can have bias and it can do this and it can do that, human beings have a lot of bias. The machine, AI, doesn't see a pregnant woman. It sees her skills, her talent, et cetera, and so it won't exclude her. We actually at Sherm just hired, she came in seven months pregnant. And a lot of folks, the human beings on the other side of the table was, why would I hire a pregnant woman? She's gonna be out. I said, AI will allow us to not screen candidates out. It doesn't see a pregnant woman. It looks at her talent, her skills, her experiences, and said that's the person who should get the job. So there's some advantage that will come from it. And how are we gonna do this? And I've talked about it. Lisa, I keep pointing at Lisa, and the screen is that way. Using AI to eliminate bias in the hiring process. It is a big part of the work that we do. If you want to create more fair, more equitable environments for people, then you've got to be able to eliminate bias in the hiring and promotions process. Managers will be able to save time by reviewing applications and we'll make sure that ultimately we get the best talent. My point, my friends, is that AI can and should be our friend. You've got to embrace it. I meet with CEOs across the globe and consistently what they are saying to us is we need our HR department, our HR professionals to embrace this technology. Many of us feel like, well that's an AI, that's a technology, that's the IT department's conversation. This is our conversation because it directly impacts how you recruit people, who you recruit, the retention of those people, and ultimately the productivity of those people, which is the business of HR, right? You've got to get the right people, but you've got to make sure they're productive. So this is the world that we're living in right now. I do want to make one little pitch and then open the floor for Q&A because I really want to talk to you about a whole bunch of other topics around the future of work around the globe. But the most important conversation that I want to leave you with right now, and I say most important, everything's important, is the importance of civility in your workplaces. HR professionals, the world has become more and more uncivil. We as human beings are at a point where we hold each other in serious contempt. We have a big election that everyone knows, November 5th, so in about two weeks, the U.S. will be uh, electing a new president, right? The person will be new no matter what because both candidates will be uh, vying for this job and neither one's the incumbent. And I gotta tell you, we are seeing incivility like nothing you've ever seen. People are fighting at work. They're being horrible to each other at work all along the lines of incivility. You have a big election coming up, December 7th, 7th right, Emily? And what we've all got to infuse into our cultures, and I know this morning the speaker spoke about the need for you to focus on culture, is that you can't talk about diversity if you don't mean diversity in every facet. So it's just not race and gender and national origin. It includes diversity of thought and perspective, political affiliation. Right now, our people have gotten really, really ugly with each other, and human resources professionals, the CEOs are looking at this and they're concerned. Because if the person is being attacked at work, they're not bringing their best selves to work. They're not productive at work. They're not happy and engaged at work. So you're not getting the best out of your employees. And if I'm a CEO, which I happen to be, for me to pay someone, funny, crazy stat, after a person, and we, this is Sherm's research, we just broke the news. After a person has experienced an act of incivility at work, it takes them on average 31 minutes to get back to their productivity level. 31 minutes, think about that. You are, see, this isn't just Johnny doesn't feel good because you hurt his feelings. Johnny is no longer producing 
And that is really important because that's why the organization is paying. So CEOs around the globe are saying this incivility conversation that we're having, or positively said, the civility conversation we have is directly what's going to be necessary to improve our productivity, our efficiency, and our overall cultures within our organization. So I just wanted to leave you with that in addition to the AI conversation. Thank you all again for having me. I really appreciate the conversation. So